Hey, so since a few months ago I recommended Jodorowsky's Dune, I figured it would be a good idea to just go ahead and make a list of a few other documentaries about film that I think everybody should check out. First of all, if you're a Kubrick fan, Filmworker is a must-watch. It follows the career of Stanley Kubrick's personal assistant, Leon Vitale, and provides unique insight into what it was like working so closely with this legendary director. It's really wonderful to see a film highlight one of the unsung heroes of cinema. When we idolize certain filmmakers, we can easily forget how filmmaking itself is a group effort at the end of the day, and how many hardworking people it takes to make an auteur's vision actually come to life. Vitale met Kubrick when he got a supporting role in Barry Lyndon, and in watching Kubrick work, his career aspirations shifted from acting to filmmaking itself. After educating himself in the editing room of his next acting project, Vitaly began working for Kubrick as a casting director on The Shining, and his responsibilities just snowballed from there. This guy did everything, and his utter dedication to every aspect of filmmaking is just beyond inspiring. I've been a Kubrick fan for as long as I can remember, and I had no idea about Vitaly's invaluable contributions to these films I love until I saw saw this documentary. Having Vitaly's hard work documented in this way has been a long time coming and I'm so glad that this film finally gives him the recognition he deserves. Speaking of expert filmmaking, you guys have to watch American Movie if you haven't already. American Movie follows independent filmmaker Mark Borchard over the course of three years as he tries to complete his film Coven so that he can finance his next film, Northwestern. American Movie is one of the most entertaining documentaries I've ever seen. I promise you, you will be quoting this thing for the rest of your life. Hey Mike, make sure everyone here has brown gloves. Does everyone have brown gloves? No, do, do, do. It's so charming, and as funny as it is, it never feels as though it's making fun of its subjects. These people and the comedy of errors that ensues because of this film they're making are just naturally hilarious. You have Mark, the subject of the documentary, who is so determined to be a successful filmmaker while kind of being blinded at times by his own narcissism and just constantly getting in his own way. And then you have his friend Mike, who is one of the most pure hearted easygoing human beings who has ever lived. And uh, we used to uh, do a lot of partying together, but I don't party anymore. <laughs> you could not write a duo as perfect as these two if you tried. If this documentary doesn't make you smile, I, I don't know what to do for you. This whole thing is turned into a theatrical mockery. Do you understand that, Mike? No. <laughs> well, you will. This film was directed by Chris Smith, who you may already be familiar with from his Netflix projects Fire, Jim and Andy, and The Disappearance of Madeline McCann. Even though there are portions of this story that are on the more serious side, overall the tone is really lighthearted and almost inspiring in a way. If there's one documentary on this list that I feel like I could recommend to literally anyone, it's this one. So check it out. I promise it's worth your time. In that same vein, I also recommend Best Worst Movie, a documentary about Troll 2 made by the star of Troll 2, Michael Paul Stevenson. If you don't know what Troll 2 is, it's basically one of the most famous So Bad It's Good films of all time. Long story short, it's where this meme came from. Oh my god! Best Worst Movie explores Troll 2's rise in popularity as a cult classic amongst lovers of So Bad It's Good filmmaking, while also interviewing many of the people involved in the making of the film itself, primarily George Hardy. George Hardy played the dad in Troll 2 and is currently working as a dentist in Alexander City, Alabama. I'm really glad that he was the primary focus of the documentary because he really is just this sweet small town guy who's just fully embraced the cult following surrounding this awful film he did years ago. And he really is at peace with how bad he is in it because he sees how much joy it brings people. And you can't piss on hospitality. I won't allow it! I like this documentary a lot because it goes over everything you would want to know about the production of Troll 2 while also being this wonderful character study of the small town dentist who just so happens to be a so bad it's good film legend. There's a couple of sad parts here and there, but the overall tone is pretty upbeat and you should totally watch it. If you're a big fan of Studio Ghibli or just animation in general, then you've got to watch The Kingdom of Dreams and Madness. This documentary follows the simultaneous production of Hayao Miyazaki's The Wind Rises and Asao Takahata's Princess Kaguya. One thing to be aware of going into this is that even though Asao Takahata is on the promotional material for the film, he really isn't in it all that much aside from showing up in the last like 20 minutes to do a short interview. I really wouldn't be surprised if the original intent of this documentary was to interview him a lot more than they did, but Takahata kind 
of had a reputation for just not showing up to work sometimes, so I think he just literally wasn't there for the time that they were filming this. So as a result, 80% of this documentary is Miyazaki just being a sassy old man, and it's glorious. Toshio Suzuki, aka the hardest working producer in show business, has quite a bit of screen time as well. He and Miyazaki have a really great personal and professional relationship, and they balance each other out really well. You get a good sense of what the day-to-day -day routine is for everyone at Studio Ghibli, and we get to sit in on a few important meetings about The Wind Rises. My favorite of which is when they come to the decision to cast Hideaki Anno as the main character of the film. It's so funny. Miyazaki really has no filter whatsoever. <laughs> If you've been a fan of Miyazaki for a while, and you've been curious to know what sort of a person he is, you're really gonna get a lot out of this. He says what he means and means what he says. The fact that he acts like this grumpy old man, but very clearly has this sweet, sentimental heart, is just one of the most endearing things of all time. I don't know, I just love it so much. And even though I still wish Takahata was in it more, especially since sadly he's no longer with us, it's still one of my personal favorite documentaries, and I highly recommend it. Next up, we have 7852 Hitchcock Shower Scene, a retrospective and in-depth analysis of the shower scene in Psycho. 78 shots, 52 cuts. This film, especially this particular scene, is so ingrained in pop culture, it's easy to forget that there was a time when no director would ever dare do something like this. If there was ever a single scene in a film that deserves its own full-length documentary, it's definitely this one. They interview both people who worked on Psycho and fans of the film. I really like how they open the film with an interview with the woman who was Janet Lee's body double, because that's who we see on camera for quite a bit of that scene, and I was glad to see her finally get some recognition in a mainstream documentary. You get to learn all about how they did the storyboards, the score and sound design for the scene, and you get to see people basically nerd out about how effective this scene still is. And that's probably my favorite thing about this documentary, is just watching how excited everyone is to talk about how much they love the film, because I love Psycho and I could watch other people gush over it all day long. I think that this is a must watch for any Hitchcock fan, and even if Psycho isn't your favorite of his, I still feel like you can get a lot out of it. Speaking of boundary pushing filmmakers, you should also watch De Palma. It's a, uh, it's, it's about Brian De Palma. It's basically one long interview with De Palma as he takes you through his career from his college days to the present. Brian De Palma was a part of the Movie Brats, a very important movement in film history which also included Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Martin Scorsese. I always feel like De Palma gets talked about the least out of any of the directors in this group, and it's unfortunate because he's made such great stuff. He's one of those guys that as he's going through his filmography, you keep going, oh shit, I forgot he did that one. His contributions to film are pretty valuable, and I'm glad that they just let him talk about it for two hours straight. The narrative is entirely from his perspective, and he totally deserves that, because he's busted his ass in this business for years, and he used to have to take a lot of shit for the risks he took. He liked to make films full of blood, sex, and murder, and the critics at the time did not treat him quite as kindly as they did some of his colleagues. So anyway, my point is, if you had that one poster of Scarface on your wall that everybody seemed to own at one point, you definitely owe this one a watch. If you feel like getting really angry, then I highly recommend this film is not yet rated. This documentary explores the inherent unfairness and lack of transparency of the MPAA's rating system for films, especially when it comes to the reasons why they choose to give a film an NC-17 rating as opposed to an R rating. It's both fascinating and infuriating when you realize how shrouded in secrecy this association is, considering they have the final say as to whether or not a film is going to get any exposure. This film explores how selective and strange the reasoning behind their rating system is, as it interviews filmmakers about their frustrating experiences with the MPAA, and also conducts a private investigation into who is responsible for rating these films. One thing to keep in mind about this documentary is that it is from 2006, so it may not fully represent the way things are handled now. But it doesn't really seem as though a tremendous amount has changed. I would actually be really excited if the filmmakers made a sequel, since it has been 14 years since this documentary came out. I would be interested to know if things have gotten any easier for film 
filmmakers with the advent of streaming, and if that has at least slightly lessened the power that the MPAA has over whether films get seen by a wider audience or not based on their content. This is for sure the most depressing film on this list, <laughs> because it's never fun to find out how the powers that be are constantly stifling artistic expression, but unfortunately that's just the way things are, so you might as well learn about it, I guess. If you're a fan of From Dust Till Dawn and you haven't seen the behind the scenes documentary Full Tilt Boogie yet, please go watch it immediately. This is definitely one of my favorites on this list because it's just such a fun watch. In spite of a couple of hiccups this film had along the way, it really just seems like most everyone had a blast making it. It's also one of the only film documentaries I can think of that interviews every single crew member you could think of. Most documentaries that you find on film production will usually interview the director, producer, actors, and maybe the special effects people, but this one really goes the extra mile and gives every member of the crew including the bus drivers, a chance to talk about their jobs. It provides so much insight into the general vibe of that shoot and really makes you feel like you were there. You are also treated to a lot of young Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino, and George Clooney shenanigans. It's just so funny seeing what a chill dude Robert Rodriguez is on set. He just always has his guitar for some reason and he just shows no signs of stress even though he's in the middle of making a $19 million film. Nobody takes themselves too seriously in this and everyone just has a really good attitude about everything even when things go wrong. It's a great one to watch if you need to cheer yourself up, and I cannot recommend this one enough. And last, but certainly not least, is The Art of Life, a documentary about David Lynch's artistic journey into filmmaking. I've recommended this documentary before, and I'm gonna do it again, because I love my boy, and I want everyone to know all about my boy. Believe it or not, Eraserhead is my most spiritual film. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why, elaborate on that. No. There are a few behind the scenes documentaries already about various films he's made, and I recommend all of those as well, but what's special about The Art of Life is it really captures who David Lynch is as a person. You really come to understand his sensibilities and how he sees the world. I think a lot of people who are aware of David Lynch but haven't really delved into his work all too much might make the assumption that he's one of these abstract filmmakers who's just weird for the sake of being weird. But I promise you that after watching this documentary that you will quickly come to realize that that is not the case at all. David Lynch is the real deal and his art comes from a very genuine place. A big focus of the documentary is about his life as a painter and how that eventually led him into wanting to make films. This was filmed over the course of four years at his home so you get to see where he lives and works every day. And much like the Brian De Palma documentary, this documentary is entirely from the perspective of its subject. It's just David Lynch talking about David Lynch, which is the perfect film for me because I love him. Um, please watch this documentary and uh, he's also been doing weather reports for the last two months on his YouTube channel, if you're interested. For those of you experiencing this weather report audio only, you can't see that I'm holding a jar. And if you haven't watched What Did Jack Do on Netflix yet, it's the best thing to come out this year, period. Stop depriving yourself. So yeah, if you found this video helpful, like, subscribe, click the bell, and thank you so much for watching. Bye.